Are we live now? I think, Professor, just to let me think people, those who are joining us through Zoom. I just, I just have one question um, then if we're uh, not quite, and that is, would you prefer me to speak using the PowerPoint or not using PowerPoint? If we have students, I don't know Jed, but to me, the students might appreciate the PowerPoint, no? That's what, that's what I thought. So that's what I prepared. I just wanted to check with you. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Professor. That would be okay. greatly appreciated, sir. Okay. Darren, you may start. Okay. So good afternoon or good morning to everybody wherever you may be in Zoom land. Welcome to Diplomatic Hours, Episode 6, Emerging Powers in the World Trading System, the Past and Future of International Economic Law. I'm Darren Mangado, a PhD student at Osaka University and today's moderator of the forum. I'm honored to join two notable scholars in international economic law and economics today. Before I introduce our speakers, I would like to introduce first the organizers and remind everybody of some of our house rules. So Diplomatic Hour is an online forum in, on international relations, political economy, and humanitarian issues that is regularly organized by Miriam College Institute of Global Affairs and Diplomacy, headed by Ambassador Laura Kimbao del Rosario, president of Miriam College, who is joining us today as well and with Drs. Aaron Zedrabena and Miguel Manuel Dorotan as program coordinators. The Institute offers Bachelor of Arts in Global Affairs and Diplomacy, major in Economic and Political Diplomacy, and Bachelor of Arts in Global Affairs and Diplomacy, major in Humanitarian Diplomacy. Now with the house rules. First, I hope to remind everybody that this event is being recorded and simultaneously streamed on Miriam College's official YouTube account. Second, I hope to request everybody to mute, to mute your audio while someone is speaking. You may unmute yourself to ask a question or give a comment during Q&A. Or you may simply type in your questions in Zoom chat box. I will try to read them all and ask our speakers for their answers or comments as long as time permits. In your questions, I hope you would identify how you would want me to address you. Otherwise, I will just call you by the name appearing on Zoom. I apologize in advance if I offend anybody. Lastly, our speakers are given up to 20 minutes for their respective talks, after which I will open the floor for discussion and Q&A. If our speakers permit, we may extend for a few more minutes to tackle relevant and interesting issues. To formally open our program, may I call on Ambassador Del Rosario for her message. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Darren. Good morning to everybody. I'm, I'm joining you from the area around Marinol College campus in Alviera near um, the former Clark Air Base. We're going to open um, next year. And so I'm here to do some site um, inspection, but I'm really happy to have Professor Schaefer with us because this topic is the area that I work in almost all of my professional life in the foreign service. You know, we all know that trade and economics are very important really in our own economic development. And so it was really uh, a big effort for, the, for all countries to put up the World Trade Organization so that at least there will be the rule of law in, in trade, especially in, in investments and even in the movement of what we call movement of goods, people, services, and capital. So... Um, we were among the founding members, so to speak. As soon as it was formalized, we joined it. And I know that the people really are, and even some of our, some of our critics, some of the, you know, people, uh, critics meaning people in the in 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 the in the sectors of of investment and trade, criticized President Ramos for joining WTO immediately. But I think in his mind that we had to join it so that at least we could somehow um, raise our standards. We, we do need up to now 
to really upgrade our policies related to trade and investment and other economic matters. Because if you don't have what we call policies that other people can trust or that are predictable or that are doable, then people will not really do business. Even a local entrepreneur will find, a local entrepreneur finds it hard really to do business in his own country, okay? And we know how important, I think everybody knew how important this was because eventually China and then Vietnam joined WTO. And when I talked to my Vietnamese counterparts, they said that joining uh, WTO really raised the economic performance of Vietnam because people trusted them, because they knew that they were operating within the parameters of the World Trade Organization. Even China, you know that, it elevated, it raised how many, 300 or 400 million out of poverty. That's amazing, you know, within 30 years. So the WTO, and, and in fact, helped them a lot. And in fact, right now, Vietnam and China are active participants in WTO, as we are also trying to do our best within that organization so that we know that the rules are fair, they're, uh, they're equitable, there's parity, par there is parity, meaning equality, among all the members, whether one is small or, or big. But ironically, people have noticed a change in the world order or the economic and trade order that was really spearheaded by the United States, you know, as soon as the war ended, Second World War, you know that the United States put up all these institutions from the World Bank to the IMF to, to make sure that everything operated within certain boundaries. So these changes and how it has affected the present realities um, will be explained by Professor Schaefer. And so I'm really, really very happy that we have him with us today and to have also Dr. Alvin Ang uh, from the Ateneo School of Government. And I know I've listened to him uh, speak in a couple of webinars and I know that he has his finger on the pulse of the Philippine uh, economic um, life. Okay, thank you very much and good morning to all the participants. And I, I'm glad that our students have signed in because I, this might be a little above their head, but I know that eventually they'll get used to these kinds of discussions as we prepare them to, to join the world of trade, investment, and political economy. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ambassador Del Rosario. I am privileged to introduce uh, our distinguished guest for today. Our main speaker is Pro Professor Gregory Schaefer, um, currently Chancellor's Professor of Law and Political Economy at the University of California, Irvine. Professor Schaefer is a well-regarded academic globally recognized for his works and his specialization in international trade law. He is the president of the American Society of International Law and sits as member of either the Board of Editors or Advisory Board of prestigious journals, such as the American Journal of International Law, the Journal of International Economic Law, and Journal of Transnational Environmental Law. He spent 20 years engaged in extensive research and field work involving interviews with public and private actors in Brazil, India, China, and at the World Trade Organization. His most recent book, Emerging Powers and the World Tr Trading System, The Past and Future of International Economic Law, published by Cambridge University Press, discusses the impacts of the international trade law order on these three countries and how they in turn built trade-related legal capacity and shaped that legal order which led to U.S. retrenchment from it. Today, Professor Schaefer will present the introduction of his book and describe its methodology. Professor uh, Schaefer's talk will be followed by comments uh, by our discussant, Professor Alvin Ang, who is Professor of Economics at Ateneo de Manila University. He directed to the research for culture, education, and social issues at the University of Santo Tomas, and served as president of the Philippine Economic Society, where he now sits as member of the board. Professor Ang specializes in labor and development economics, competition, privatization, and public finance. Our Q&A will commence after Professor Ang's comments. I will now turn over the Zoom podium to Professor Schaefer. Professor, if you are ready, thank you very much. Thank you very much for that introduction. Um, I'm gonna, before I start, um, this, I wanna welcome the students um, 
as a, as a pres incoming president for the American Society of International Law, I want you to know that 40% of our membership it lives outside the United States. And if you go to the American Societies of International Law website, you will see many videos, many articles, all for free. And our annual meeting is coming up and there's special, special offers for participation for students. Um, and so I encourage you uh, to look into this. And the, the world of international law, of course, is of incredible importance today, especially as we see so much of the international legal order under challenge, be it because of uh, violations of basic sovereign rights. Now we see with respect to the invasion of the Ukraine um, or sort of the, the decline of the automatic binding dispute settlement system, the rule of law for international trade. Um, and so the, the, the idea of international trade is that it creates connections with people uh, across borders. And in that way, potentially it can lead to peace. But we see a decline of the rule of law generally, not only with respect to trade, but now with respect to basic challenges to peace. Um, and so that's just a quick backdrop to this book. I'm gonna share my screen so that um, you can see some PowerPoint for the book. So first of all, um, let me just move this off my screen there so you can see the PowerPoint. So this is the book. Um, it's in paperback. It's in uh, it's, uh, electronic copies as well are available. Um, and, uh, and so you know, the, clearly the cover uh, is about the challenges um, with your, and the central challenge being the US-China relationship. And what this book does is it traces the development of this, you know, China's, India's, and Brazil's uh, engagement with the world trading system and how it affected them internally. It was mentioned as sort of the major changes that took place in China, the ambassador mentioned, um, but also in Vietnam and elsewhere. And it looks at these three countries and it compares the changes within them, but it simultaneously looks at the changes that took place in, this, in the system itself because of their building of what I call legal capacity, the ability to use law to defend and advance their own interests in the broader trade regime. It's based on interviews with uh, everybody from ambassadors of these three countries, director general of the WTO to, um, to members of the WTO appellate body, other members of the secretariat, business associations, NGOs, uh, government officials um, across different levels, um, as well as some time that I spent at the World Trade Organization. And it, it's, um, and so that's the methodology behind the book. Now, this is well known in US political economy. I don't know if, if you know of this book, but it's by a political scientist, John Eikenberry. And he talked about the GATT and the WTO as a, as a form of, of, of what a victor after a world war, um, after World War II, it created rules, it created institutions, um, which it felt advanced its own vision of world order. Um, many of these, many, much of this vision sort of replicated the laws and norms inside the United States itself. And you saw this especially then become much more intensified after the victory of the United States in the Cold War. 1989, 1990s, which gave rise to the transformation of the what was called the GATT, which had been formed after World War II, into the World Trade Organization. And he called this a new global constitutional settlement in which the US would rule through law, rule through rules, but at the same time, it was liberal because the US bound itself to these rules. Okay. And what the book traces is especially under the administration of President Donald Trump, but we still see it today under the administration of President Joseph Biden, 
the US unraveling of this world trading system. So that the US, in a sense, even though it often blamed China for being the revisionist power, the US upset the rules of the game for trade. And the question is, what explains this? You traditionally see narrative explanations which are economic and political in nature. And this book tells a complementary legal narrative because the three are intertwined, economics, politics, political economy, and law. So here, if you look at the three lines, the red line is China, the blue line is the United States, and the green line is the combination of the gross domestic product of China, Brazil, and India. You get the top chart is a purchasing power parity, how far your money goes. And the bottom chart is nominal GDP. You can see that in terms of purchasing power parity, how China already has surpassed the United States and how the three of them have vastly surpassed the United States. And below you see, with respect to nominal GDP, how these countries, including China, have closed the gap. And it's predicted that China by the year 2030 will surpass the United States. And so the economic narrative is simply that increase in, in the importance of trade of these countries has shaped the legal system. Um, the political narrative is that the size of your GDP also is a form of power. You see this leverage that China can exercise by withdrawing access to its market um, when it after it becomes the largest trading nation in the world. So this book tells a complementary legal story. Here's a, a picture of the outside of the World Trade Organization in Geneva. And the book's central question is, how has the international trade and broader economic legal order, that is trade, investment, and intellectual property, changed since the WTO's creation because of Brazil's, India's, and China's rise in the development of what I call trade law capacity and the role of law within this organization in Geneva. One can break this down into three questions. First, how did Brazil, India, and China invest in trade law capacity, invest in students, in professions, in the legal profession, to take on the United States and the European Union at the WTO and defend their interests. This picture, just so you know, is a picture of the Foreign Affairs Ministry in Brasilia, in Brazil. Um, and Brazil was the first to really build trade law capacity um, in the WTO to challenge the United States and Europe. Second, in doing so, how did they, these emerging powers change internally? How did they, how do we think about what sort of changes took place within them? And third, what are the implications of these developments for the WTO and the broader transnational legal order for trade and economic governance? This is, so but the theoretical background is I'm very interested in the interaction between international law and the nas and national legal systems and legal practice. By transnational legal ordering, I refer to the processes through which norms are constructed, flow, settle, and unsettle transnationally across levels of social organization. So the argument would, or the question would be, how did WTO law, what sort of impacts did it have on national law and legal practice and institutions within countries around the world? The result of these processes can give rise to one or more transnational legal orders. The concept refers to a collection of formalized legal norms and associated organizations and actors that authoritatively order the understanding and practice of law across national jurisdictions. So think of customs law, think of intellectual property law, think of anti-dumping law, think of tariff law, all sorts, think of different forms of standardization and regulatory law. All of these arguably are affected by the WTO. The trade law capacity, what do I mean by that? I define it as the ability of a country through harnessing resources to use law 
to defend and advance its international and domestic trade and trade implicated policies. When the ambassador negotiates new trade deals, um, it needs to, to, get to advance one's interests. One has to have a real clear understanding of the implications of the law that one is signing. Trade law capacity represents a form of capital or power to advance one's interests in a contested legal field, that of trade law. The concept can be viewed, uh, has its equivalence in other disciplines as it constitutes a form of power for political scientists and an incentive-driven investment for economists. Okay, so how does trade law matter? Well, um, the argument of the book is that it matters in many different ways than one conventionally uh, takes into account. One, trade law capacity matters for the drafting and the negotiation of international trade rules. Two, it matters for the monitoring of foreign compliance with commitments. You don't, to be able to know that your foreign trading partner is complying with it, you need legal capacity to assess whether or not it's in compliance. And if it's not, then you need legal capacity to bring complaints successfully in specific cases to challenge uh, a trade barrier of another country that is having negative impacts on say the Philippines exports. Or it shapes the interpretation, application and social understanding of the law over time, shaping the meaning of legal obligations. Very sophisticated actors know that law is subject to interpretation and that by developing legal capacity, one can shape the understanding, the interpretation of the law, which will then shape what obligations one has and one's trading partners has. Economically, that will shape the terms of trade effects affecting a country's social welfare, the ability for others to raise tariffs on it, which will negatively affect its trade flows, for example. Next, oops. Whenever one has a trade dispute, just like in law generally, most legal disputes are settled. They're settled in what's called the shadow of the law. Bargaining takes place in the shadow of the law, both as regards future negotiations and the strategic pursuit in dis of settlement in discrete cases. So you try to settle a case, you say, if you don't settle it, then we will bring a, a claim against you and we'll be able to retaliate against you. If you win a case, it'll set the meaning, the understanding of the law, which will shape future negotiations, such as over agriculture, for example. It protects domestic policy space for developmental and regional initi regulatory initiatives. It wards off capture by protectionist sectors because it enables a government to tell a protectionist sector that we can't raise tariffs. Um, it triggers spillover effects because it catalyzes a greater role for a country's lawyers in international private law setting for investment for commercial uh, nego uh, contracts. It's not easy to build trade law capacity. You need to build expertise, which is very costly. And, and not all countries have the same amount of financial resources to develop that expertise. And also there's the challenge of political power because uh, countries which are much more powerful can try to uh, disincentivize your development of expertise to defend your own interests. And it, there's a the challenge of internal governance. If you have corruption, um, if, uh, if there's a sense that power matters or connections matter more than, than argument, than reason, then you're less likely to uh, be able to successfully develop trade law expertise. Investing in trade law capacity means investing in professionalization of a trade bureaucracy, coordination between ministries, the development of careers in trade law. This affects its Janus face, that just means both looking outward and inward as the Roman God had looked in both directions, Janus, Outward, you're looking at barriers that your country faces. Inward, you're looking at trade barriers, uh, protectionism that um, 
may, that can be challenged by third countries, that you want to try to protect yourself by, by developing your own internal law in a way that will withstand legal challenge. It involves popular understanding, coverage in the media, changes in academia, new courses, moot courts, greater role of lawyers in trade, development of a private bar, changes in the private sector with new specialists and with think tanks, and public-private partnerships between the government and civil society, business, and academia. This transnational legal ordering can be viewed along different dimensions. For example, it involves changes in law and practice, changes in the law of books, and changes in legal practice. It involves changes in the boundary of the state, in the market. In other words, you open up the market or you may close off the market in certain ways. So what's the relative role of the state and markets? It changes the allocation of authority among state institutions, such as between the executive, the legislature, courts, between central authorities and provincial authorities, cities and the central government. It involves changes in expertise and the role of expertise and changes in associational patterns, such as um, interactions between national officials and, and foreign officials and international officials and changes then consequently in accountability for what you do. So the book has, after setting up sort of the overall argument, it looks in detail at what happened in Brazil in India, and in China, with two chapters on China given China's importance. So here is a picture of China joining the WTO in 2001. It, it actually wanted to join the GATT in 1986, but it was blocked primarily by the United States. Its protocol for accession, and this just shows the amount of legal capacity involved, itself involved 900 pages. The WTO agreements with all the schedules are over 20,000 pages. Okay. Um, China, when they created, when they joined the WTO, this is quite remarkable. They created an office for the cleanup of laws and regulations, where all laws were divided into four categories, laws and regulations to be kept, those to be revised, those to be abolished, and those to be reenacted. The WTO could be viewed in many ways as an amendment to China's constitution. It, uh, it had such sweeping effects within China's legal system. China created new institutions. So for example, here's a new Chinese uh, Court of Appeals for Intellectual Property Disputes that it created in December, 2018. And there's now mass litigation over intellectual property in China. Um, most of it, the vast majority of it be being between Chinese um, and trademarks and copyrights and patents as China be tries to move up the scale of innovation. China invested a huge amount in building trade law knowledge. It organized thousands of academic seminars uh, in, in linked up with its um, development of joining the WTO. Um, I participated in some of those. I taught a course in China. It's not only did it invite uh, experts to China to teach courses, but it also sent officials to the United States so that at my university, judges, Chinese judges came to learn about not only US law, but also WTO law. Thousands of WTO law books were published in China, more than the rest of the world combined. It, in academia, this is a picture of a moot court competition. The first moot court that China created, this is actually the Ministry of Commerce created it, was in WTO law. And these are the students who won the moot court competition. And the Chinese government and private law firms identified these students as some of the best students to try to hire to build their own legal capacity. 
He saw law firms, this is from the highest levels of the party, calling for the acceleration of the reform and development of the legal profession in China. You go to China now, you see mega law firms, a thousand lawyers and, uh, and skyscrapers and glass buildings and fancy offices. It's a major transformation of law within China as it opened up. What you saw here was the development of public-private partnerships. So China, for every WTO case that it had, it hired on the one hand, either a US or European law firm, but in parallel, it hired a Chinese law firm. And it required the American or European law firm to work with a Chinese law firm. And this represented a form of technology transfer, a transfer of legal technology to indigenous Chinese law firms so that they could defend the government, not only in the WTO, but potentially in investment litigation. And many of these lawyers now are involved um, in the Belt and Road Initiative, for example. He saw the development of a new anti-dumping bar um, within China from scratch, from nothing. All new institutions, new courts, new professions all took place in China because of the WTO. You saw Chinese uh, companies uh, hiring vast number of lawyers uh, to deal with tr international trade matters. This is Huawei, um, who had many intellectual property lawyers um, and, and other lawyers defending Huawei's uh, business around the world. To compare a little bit with Brazil, Brazil, what it did, it professionalized its Ministry of Foreign Affairs. It created a new legal department within it for the first time. It, uh, it had well-funded trade associations. Um, it had elite law firms who had already been involved in transnational commercial business that now tried to tap into trade law. And in academia, you saw new uh, developing new courses, you had new think tanks, and you had civil society organizations becoming quite active. In all of these three countries, what's quite interesting, this is true with China and also with India, was that here with Brazil, they first were on the defensive and they saw that WTO, they needed to develop legal capacity to defend themselves. So two early cases against the Brazil, one was against the sort of its Sim, it's the its company, which was a symbol for its rise as a uh, as a re, as a as an economic power to be taken seriously, and this is its mid-sized jet aircraft company, Embraer. And Canada brought a suit regarding the subsidization by the government of Embraer. That received front page coverage in all the Brazilian newspapers. And second, the US brought a case against Brazil's patent law system in the context of the AIDS crisis, once again, rallying civil society interests. Brazil created what it referred to and became known in Geneva as a three pillar uh, model, which involved a specialized dispute settlement unit in Brazil in its Ministry of Foreign Affairs, its officials in the Brazilian mission in Geneva, and the private sector, law firms, economic consultancies. And they would all interact and with respect to any WTO case that enhanced the informational capacity of the government um, by working and, all its, and the resources and the knowledge base of the government in the WTO system. The private sector, you had academia getting highly involved, trade associations becoming involved, um, you had think tanks, new think tanks, especially in the agricultural sector created major new think tanks, new consultancies, law firms got involved, NGOs and social movements got involved, especially on intellectual property rights issues and patents, and that's intersectional with health law, but also environmental law. The approach in practice, here's a, a, the Embraer case, in the beginning, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the, and the Brazilian mission just worked with a foreign law firm. They didn't use a Brazilian law firm. 
But soon, as they develop legal capacity here, in a, in a famous case involving chicken, uh, the poultry case, they hired a local Brazilian law firm who worked with a Brazilian trade association representing the poultry sector. When Brazil was a respondent, this is what there was the European Union challenged a regulation of Brazil, which banned the importation to Brazil of retreaded tires. And those retreaded tires came predominantly from Europe and Germany. Here, Brazil worked with the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, its mission in Geneva, it created an internship in Geneva to send students there who were getting PhDs in trade law to work in the Geneva mission. Um, they also created internship in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs. They worked with Brazilian law firms. They worked with a foreign law firm. Um, and they also worked with NGOs. What's quite interesting is NGOs filed an amicus brief defending Brazil's regulations from an environmental perspective. And Brazil actually in, in, in main part won the bulk of the case. And so that was quite important. You saw civil society, Brazilian civil society working with the government. The challenges, clearly there are challenges to this approach. One, limited institutionalization, especially the poor the country is, it's less likely to institutionalize this expertise so that the career incentives will be maybe to do one case and then to leave the government to do something else. And so how do you retain this expertise over time? It's not cheap, a very high cost for the private sector. So when Brazil brought a famous case against the United States with respect to US cotton subsidies, they won the case, but the legal fees cost over a million United States dollars. Um, at the end of the day, the US settled this case by paying over $300 million. I, I can't remember the exact amount, but it may be, it, I mean, over, let's see, I, that's too much. It was a hundred million, it was a lot of money, it was a huge amount. So it was a very profitable case in the end, but of course there were high risks. Um, determining the public interest, there can be concern that the private sector and the public sector, the government might have different interests in a case. And some cases are viewed as systemic where there might not be a private sector, but it's important for a country. And then the question becomes, this is, Brazil was able to do this, but how transportable is this for smaller and poorer countries? So in general, you see sort of this greater role of developing public and private expertise. You can think of this as a form of infrastructure, right? How do you, you know, so much of, of uh, economic development is based on developing infrastructure. Well, also important for economic development are, is law to provide certainty and predictability. To shape that law, you need some form of legal infrastructure. And these countries successfully invested in that. So the international trade regime, how to think about it? It's seeded incentives for institutional changes within, these, within states to develop trade law capacity. State policy favored public-private partnerships because it was, the government couldn't, it was too expensive to develop all this expertise within the government itself, even within China. And so China encouraged the development of expertise in the private sector, in particular in private law firms. Involved the embedding of public and private legal expertise regarding trade within these states, which enabled them to build state capacity so you can view state capacity as this combination of public and private expertise. And that way they could adapt, respond to challenges, and potentially and recursively shape the transnational legal order for trade. And some transnational processes did not lead to the weakening of the state, but rather to the strengthening of the state's capacity to play an active role internationally in the legal ordering of trade. Well, this led to US disenchantment, which explains in part where we are today. That is that 
The rise of China, India, and Brazil helped shake up politics in the United States and Europe. On the one hand, the income of the working classes in the United States and Europe stagnated and job security became more precarious. On the other hand, now it was others, Chinese in manufacturing, Indians in services, Brazilians in agriculture, who outcompeted Americans and Europeans and whose systems thus must involve, and this is in the words of President Trump, cheating. Well, they just became more competitive. You can see the shaping of the trade legal order in three ways. One, their legal capacity investments facilitated their enhanced engagement in negotiations that contributed to stalemate in the WTO's negotiating forum because they were able to block US and European initiatives that they said were not in their interests. They become quite active nonetheless in sponsoring new uh, uh, new forms of negotiations which remain active in the WTO, including regarding investment and services. They've, um, it, it led the United States to block the appointment of new members to the WTO appellate body. And so the World Trade Court, the appellate body, has become neutered because the United States has blocked any replacement of the, of the judges after their term expired. But it didn't lead to the end of trade law. It led rather to the fragmentation of trade law and investment, just like investment law, and to many different regional and bilateral agreements. And so as a result, you now have competing bilateral and regional initiatives, the CPTPP, RCEP, and bilateral agreements. Uh, in, in, uh, for the legal ordering of trade. So what's the role of trade law capacity going forward? Well, paradoxically, these countries' investment in legal capacity has helped catalyze the potential collapse of multilateral trade, the multilateral trading regime, this dispute settlement system, which could add, raise the question, what's the benefit of trade law capacity going forward? Well, if the world turns to major conflicts, law will retreat in terms of its importance. We will see sort of the use of law in what is referred to as lawfare terms of referring to the law, um, but not, not settling disputes before neutral third party dispute settlement bodies, uh, such as the International Court of Justice or the WTO appellate body. But we will see a move to plurilateral and regional initiatives, bilateral deals, unilateralism, tit for tat responses. Law will still play a role. The challenge for all of us then is what role for the WTO and multilateralism in this more complex ecology of trade law. We now see trade law not as a centralized WTO system, but rather as an ecology of, co of competition of different forms of different organizations, institutions, agreements. Um, the, uh, and countries are caught, Philippines is caught in this US-China rivalry. The big risk is if we refer, return to the 1930s, which of course led to world war. Let us hope that we're not there. I see three alternatives for WTO, especially its dispute settlement system. Some would be are pushing for adding new rule-based constraints to try to constrain China. I think this will not go very far. The other way is to simply remove the sort of the legal system and just everything becomes a, involves power-based bargaining. I, my hope is that somehow we can reach some sort of pragmatic rebalancing within a fra multilateral framework that will recognize policy space, but nonetheless, the resolution of disputes through a neutral third party forum. That would provide for a bit more economic policy space um, through the interpretation of import relief laws to protect uh, your own economy through safeguards, countervailing duties against subsidies. There would be more national security policy space, including through adoption, adaptation of rules being developed in bilateral and regional agreements, such as regarding critical infrastructure and cybersecurity concerns. And there'll be some elaboration of mechanisms to protect policy space regarding social policy, 
um, over time. So I imagine for dispute resolution, potentially, this is up to the Biden administration now. You could see a return to WTO dispute settlement system. We could see enhanced use of non-adjudicatory mechanisms, or we could see a variable geometry, what we see now in the WTO. Some countries agreeing to binding dispute settlement system, but only with a subset of countries. You could even imagine the United States doing this with the entire world, except for China. So I'm just gonna end here and just say thank you. Um, I appreciate uh, this opportunity to talk about this book. Um, and I really look forward to the comments and any questions you might have regarding uh, the world trading system, Philippines, uh, and so forth. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schaefer, for that insightful theoretical, empirical, and methodological survey of the contemporary transnational economic legal order. And may I now call on uh, Professor Ang for our main discussant for his comments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Schaefer. Uh, this is a, a wonderful, uh, uh, you know, trying to part included in this the new world order that we are uh, encountering, and and it's it, it's amazing that uh, that you were able to put this and contextualize it, particularly in the elements of national capacity. Um, this is what we have been uh, considering and looking here at, you know, not just the Philippines, but I think many developing countries. The issue is the conversion of whatever you have agreed in the multilateral international level and bringing it back home. And when you bring it back home to the home countries, the, the, the challenge is enormous, much, much larger than what you have been able to get as concessions or agreements. Uh, and I like the way you describe Brazil and China, how they invested in these capacities. And this is really something that um, uh, uh, ASEAN, for example, where we are, need to really look into a very more detailed kind of uh, developing capacities. And the, the challenge of developing cap capacities is that it doesn't happen overnight. <laughs> we need a lot of time and a lot of resources um, financially and and like what you said, you need to bring in experts and 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 um, like Brazil has to send people to 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 go on on uh, practicum in the WTO itself. So this is like like uh, a big challenge. Just converting it, uh, for example, here in the Philippines. Uh, I don't know if you're aware that um, um, about about a year, more than a year ago, just before the pandemic, we increased our rice tariff uh, so that um, you know, it's actually something that we have to go to the WTO uh, and say that we will increase tariff of rice um, and allow more rice to come in, but they have to pay or they have to be, uh, there's an additional tariff. Uh, and it is something that is very complicated because rice is a major output of our agricultural sector. Mm -hmm. And I guess the debate is not just any kind of uh, neoliberalist analysis, but you really have to go into the capacities of implementation. Theoretically, you can, I uh, mean, uh, economists like us and those who are aware of international law can just draw some graphs and do the maths. But once you bring it down to those who will implement it, that is where the big challenge uh, that's coming in. Um, and I think, uh, especially right now, the Philippines has not signed the RCEP. Uh, and, and, you know, it's going to bring down a lot of tariff. But again, the challenge is because of the experience of what happened to the rice liberalist, uh, rice uh, tarification law is that it could be happening in almost uh, any product that uh, the Philippines or uh, ASEAN for that matter is competing in the world market. And so it's it's not a simple thing. Uh, I think here in the Philippines, uh, and I think in much of Southeast Asia, the expertise in international law and competition is very limited. And, uh, you know, the, the, the discussion in many of the in many of the uh, 
uh, understanding of all of this is very parochial in nature, you know, looking at the local interest. But it's really that because we are part of the global value chain and it is inevitable that we have to work around it. And like what you said um, at the uh, towards the last part is what are we going to do with, you know, with countries not respecting what they had signed or uh, or creating new orders around it? And how do we like uh, like what you said, if the United States and the, and the EU does not see things in their favor, uh, these rules can be bent or this can be challenged another way around. So if that is the case, then it's it's uh, how do we invest uh, moving forward uh, in the in the capacities that are are required? Um, and and I'm I'm really like you know looking at our our post pandemic world wherein you know this pandemic has created a huge problem of supply chain and i think many countries are actually just you know saying that using the pandemic as an excuse and is that enough to like say that these things should not be followed anymore so very interesting uh uh thought provoking elements in your book and i think this is something that um that uh, we in the ASEAN, in the Philippines, for example, uh, we need to know more. We need to learn more and we need to equip people more. It's, it's more than just raising the awareness because awareness is one thing, but you know, really understanding the new world order and with digitalization coming full force, I think people just see it as a, it's e-commerce, but it's way beyond that. And it will change the way of doing things, uh, including international law and agreements. And so, um, well, we are coming into a presidential election. We're going to change the administration in two, three months. And I, I doubt it that this had even come into the, you know, to the consciousness of many of uh, our candidates, regardless, I think, of the level of, uh, of uh, elective position, because this is even... Uh, applicable to the local levels, like what you said, you know, um, when you implement it, the nationals or the federal governments may uh, negotiate it, but then you have to, you know, tell everyone this is what we have, have agreed in the international level. And so the capacity, um, the governance capacity requirement is just so heavy and it's so pressing that um, uh, we need really to, to design uh, a system wherein we have a plan of how many uh, how many international think tanks or or uh, compet compet competition uh, influence lawyers or 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 or, or, or sort sort of that uh, I I I'm not sure that we have that ready uh, soon because as I know it uh, many of the same people are getting invited to do these things to explain locally. So that means the expertise is quite small. So this book of yours will influence, hopefully our, uh, and, and this audience that we have right now, the policymakers to think through all of this and, and uh, look at the experience of Brazil, China, and, and India in developing their own capacities. Uh, we may not, not reach that same level, but at least understand why and the importance of, uh, of uh, capacitating uh, and how far should we go, going to the universities, introducing a, 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 as part of the continuing uh, legal education in the country and, and creating an opportunity to, to bring that up to a higher level. So, so I, I, I commend you for bringing this out and, and uh, you know, this is the big elephant in the room. We are, we are all going into WTO meetings, the RCEP and ASEAN and all of these uh, regional trade agreements. Um, only the people who are negotiating understand it very well. That's that's I, how I see it. And when they bring it back home, that's where the problem comes. And and you you see that uh, there are uh, there are uh, resistance then if we are going to sign it or even agree to it because of experiences that have happened in the past. Yeah. So I guess uh, that's my my uh, sharing with what you have uh, shared, uh, Professor Shaper. 
Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Ang. I really appreciate that. Um, you know, there's so many different ways of thinking about how to, um, to develop legal capacity. And um, you know, there are international institutions that are available. There's, you know, sending, there's internships, including in the WTO. You know, some countries are much better than others. You know, there's WTO um, centers that the WTO sponsors, and one can try to become a WTO center. One can create networks, right? Um, so networks are so important, um, be it with civil society organizations or otherwise. So um, creating links, right? Networks is so important, um, including within ASEAN, right? So that one shares expertise um, and shares experiences. But thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, um, Professor Ang, for your succinct comment. And also, again, thank you very much, Professor Schaefer. Now we open the floor for questions or comments. But before I, I, I collect questions, I'd like to ask um, Professor Schaefer a, a request or a question um, building on uh, Professor Alvin Ang's uh, comment. So some observers lament uh, the not so vibrant um, uh, state of international law education and the number actually limited number of international law experts from developing countries. One example here is the Philippines. Um, in fact, um, uh, the Philippines, except for the Philippine Solicitor General, was represented um, by legal counsel composed of non nationals um, in its arbitration case with China on the South China Sea. And one possible reason for that is probably because international law is not a well-known um, co uh, subject in the Philippines. And at the same time, uh, there are not a lot of international experts in the Philippines. So uh, for the benefit of our students here, maybe uh, possible if Professor Schaefer can talk about um, the perks, privileges, challenges of, of an international law experts. Maybe we can inspire some students here to, um, to become experts themselves. Thank you. Yes, well, there's, um, you know, it was a U.S. law firm in Washington, D.C., Foley Hoag, um, which represented the Philippines and that arbitration. If you think about that, the question is, um, you know, clearly China was very upset by that arbitration, um, but it was upset because it feared it, right? If, it, if the arbitration was completely meaningless, it wouldn't have had to be so vociferous in its response to it. Um, because the arbitration did have some normative power, right? It was a declaration, a finding under law that China was in violation of its commitments, which of course is very important for uh, Philippine fishermen, for the Philippine uh, nation and for its national security and so forth. Um, and so one, it just, it, it taught that as an example of just the relevance, right? Of uh, even, even, you know, it, law is always something, which as I mentioned, it's a bargaining chip, right? It's not, you, the internet, you can't force China to comply, but it can provide normative leverage, right? In your relationship when you have a declaration on your side. Um, and China then did try to, you know, has tried to, you know, uh, negotiate some sort of settlement, but it's nonetheless, it's in a, the Philippines is in a better position counterfactually than it would be without that decision, right? Um, and, and so, so that's the relevance. Obviously it's incredibly exciting, right? To be able to, even if one were an intern at Foley Hoag, right? Or an intern in the Ministry of Foreign Affairs to go to The Hague, uh, to go to, um, to the, you know, the Court of International Arbitration, um, it's, it's an incredibly exciting opportunity. Um, you meet brilliant people from around the world, um, people who care about justice and, um, and care about developing legal norms um, and care about the rule of law. And so that's exciting. I mean, the people who worked on that case, um, I know the main partner, you know, they're, they're fascinating people. Um, and, uh, and the main partner actually spoke at the American Society of An International Law Annual uh, 
uh, its conference in in um, Washington D.C. The um, you know opportunities for students they a, a there's something called the Jessup Moot Court. Um, that's a, a moot court where you learn international law and then you argue in a competition. Um, the winners, the, the competition start um, nationally, then they move to the region, and then the school, the winning students actually go to Washington, D.C. Singapore has been very successful. It's often wins. Uh, National University of Singapore actually uh, is very successful in these competitions. So, um, so that's a, a, that can be incredibly exciting because again, it's an opportunity to be hired by law firms, represent your country um, and so forth. Um, it's a real investment in, uh, in what can be viewed as sort of intellectual capital, right? To advance your own career, life prospects and, and defend what you believe in um, and help your country. Many, many students who do this, they do study abroad. So much of the international law is about networking with other people. Um, and I've co-taught a class out of Singapore, for example, on international trade law, and you see those students investing. Um, and so it's looking for opportunities. Um, when I was a, I've had uh, the opportunity to, just to work to, do work abroad on a Fulbright scholarship. The United States has the Fulbright. Um, you can try to apply for different scholarships, such as a Fulbright to go study or do work abroad. Um, that's a real opportunity. Many of the people in China, India, and Brazil had studied abroad and then come back home. Um, that was quite interesting to see. Um, they had developed their own networks. It's um, to me, anyway, it's one of the most fascinating areas of law. Um, you know, when I was a young student, I was trying to determine, do I want to become an environmental lawyer? I was very passionate about that. Do I want to become an international lawyer? And I am now mix, you know, international environment, human rights, trade, the economy, investment. They're all interlinked, labor. Um, and so it's, uh, and you meet fascinating people. The WTO itself, if you had the good fortune to get an internship at the WTO, there are people from around the world there. Um, the, uh, there I did mention this. The, there's a uh, organization called the Advisory Center on WTO Law in Geneva, and its deputy director general is from the Philippines. He was the attache to the mission on WTO dispute settlement. He's a friend of mine. His name is uh, Dr. Leo Palma. Um, and so you see... Uh, Filipinos, you know, in international organizations. Um, you see them uh, at the WTO and so forth. When I was at, um, I worked, it no longer exists, but there's a major civil society organization called the International Center of Trade Sustainable Development. Um, one of its uh, higher level interns was from the Philippines. Um, so you see these opportunities for students. Uh, he had a life in Geneva that it would, would, would fly him around the world. We attended, for example, at, at, in Jakarta, we, we organized a regional meeting um, for uh, representatives and in, 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 in professors in the region to try to develop legal capacity. Um, and, uh, and he was part of that. He also went to a regional meeting in Kenya, for example, that we organized. Um, and so we had another one in Brazil, we had another one in China. Um, and so there, there are real opportunities to travel around the world and to develop knowledge and meet people, which is a, a quite wonderful uh, prospect if you can do this. Thank you very much, Professor Schaefer. Um, I have here a question from um, from Dr. From Dr. Abena. Um, so what do you make of the so-called economic decoupling between China and the US? and how other countries such as Japan, India, Canada, Australia, and European powers are seeking to shift their supply chains away from China due to political tension. In addition, um, another question is that as an update, what is the Biden administration doing to rectify or continue Trump's disruptions of the international economic legal order? Okay, so, 
first of all, I'll take the second question first, okay? The second question is, um, what's the Biden administration doing? Well, it's in, the, it's in its second year. Um, it clearly still has retained all of the tariffs on China and it's retained uh, that Trump imposed. And it's re and it continues to block appointments to the WTO appellate body. However, what its strategy has been is to build alliances. And so it's settled many of it and it's removed tariffs from most of its allies. It's been negotiating these with the European Union, with Japan, with Canada and Mexico. Um, it signed, of course, even under the Trump administration, it signed a new replacement of NAFTA, a regional trade agreement with Mexico and Canada. And so the Biden, and of course, now the Biden administration has this new initiative, the Indo-Pacific initiative, especially for e-commerce e and digital trade that it's very interested in. So you see that at least it's got a two-pronged strategy. Prong one, is to settle, to unravel the tensions that the Trump administration created with all of its allies, right? Austria. And, and so this, and prong two is to develop its own initiatives. It doesn't look like it's going to join the, the CPTPP by the Trans-Pacific Partnership, but it is going to come up with something, right? Um, which it's going to try to negotiate with the Philippines and other countries. The, um, because it's in, I mean, if anything, this is an opportunity for countries like ASEAN, in my view, that with the rivalry between China and the United States, it's possible that to get potentially better deals, because both of them are concerned about uh, the, the influence of, of one over the other. Um, and so this is a possibility potentially for ASEAN and the Philippines. Um, the, the, uh, what it's going to do with respect to China, it has, it's under pressure within the United States to create exemptions to the tariffs. So it would retain the tariffs in name, but it would create exemptions in practice. And uh, companies, of course, who would like these Chinese inputs are very important for them because otherwise their, their costs go up and they become less competitive. They are petitioning the Biden administration to be exempt from the, from the tariffs. And so you could potentially see more and more exemptions. Um, you may see uh, some negotiations with China, um, but of course, right now, the Biden administration's, all of its, its uh, focus is on the Ukraine and on Russia right now. And so that is a major event in world history. Uh, we're experiencing it right at this moment, and uh, it simply will not give as much attention to trade as long as this major conflict continues. Um, the the so-called economic decoupling between China and the U.S. and how other countries uh, are seeking to shift their supply chains away from uh, China due to political tensions. So far, there's been a lot of talk about this. But if you look at actual trade flows, there's still huge imports, right? Ch imports from, the, from China to the United States actually are increasing and the trade deficit is expanding. Um, and so companies still are trying to tap into the efficiencies of low cost production. And China is a very uh, efficient producer. And so most of what it it, it, the very definition of a supply chain, China isn't producing the final product, it's producing inputs often, uh, which go into products. And so companies want to get the best inputs at the best price possible. And so they're still purchasing from China. Um, over the longer term, you will see uh, the attempt, at least for some critical supplies potentially, to shift away from China. Um, but it will, won't be overnight. Entire economic systems of companies, multinational companies are based on these imports. So they'll try to diversify, um, but so far we don't see signs of a complete, de, you know, of quote decoupling. And I don't think we'll see decoupling. Rather, I'll, I think we'll see shifts and we'll see uh, an, an attempt to create uh, greater resilience 
So you're not dependent 100% on China. Um, but it's, it's too early to tell. Um, much of it will be depend on geopolitical tensions, uh, including with respect to the conflict uh, or the conflict, the war right now in the Ukraine um, and, uh, and how China, China responds to this. Um, and, um, and then of course, with the South China Sea and with Taiwan, um, if, you know, if there's someday uh, an invasion of Taiwan, I would imagine you'll see much greater decoupling um, like you're seeing right now, Russia being blocked off. Um, from global finance. Um, U.S., of course, doesn't trade that much with China, with Russia. Um, so it, 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 it's, it, Russia doesn't have much leverage over the United States, at least economically. China is a different question, right? So it'll be very interesting to see how they manage their political and economic relationships over the next years. Thank you very much again. Um, if you have questions, please feel free to type in your questions and send it to us or unmute yourself. Um, is there anyone who wants to ask a question? Otherwise, um, since you mentioned uh, Professor Schaefer of the Ukraine crisis, um, what do you think would be the effect of, of significant non-economic um, issues such as the COVID-19 pandemic and now the Ukraine crisis to the international economic legal order? Um, well, it, it, I mean, clearly this is, this is a violation of fundamental law of the United Nations Charter, the, 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 the core principles of the UN Charter. And so this is, this is a, this is going to be, and it's right on the on on the European continent. Um, so directly, you see Germany for the first time rearming um, since World War II. Um, so it's going to have major implications uh, for trade, for economies like COVID. I think it's going to, you know, everybody's going to suffer economically uh, because of this. Um, there, um, there, there will be negative repercussions uh, because of the importance of, rum, of oil for Europe, Western Europe. You're gonna see uh, greater inflation around the world, uh, and, which we already see, but it, could, it likely will get worse. Um, and, uh, and it's gonna create increased distrust, right? And, uh, and law only works if you have trust. Um, Russia is not as important economically, uh, certainly not for global supply chains, but China is. Um, and so it will be, the, you know, what will be China's response to all of this? I mean, I think China is in a difficult situation. Um, a core principle of China, at least formally, is the respect of sovereign integrity and non-interference in domestic affairs. Clearly, an invasion by tanks is... Uh, and an attempt to shift the, the, govern, the government of the Ukraine and change it by force as a violation of core norms. So how China will respond to this, including in the UN General Assembly tomorrow, it'll be quite fascinating. Um, but uh, tomorrow, my time, maybe today, your time, I'm not sure. Um, but uh, that's good. These developments will, will be important. I think that it's, this is also not good for the international trade legal order um, because uh, the attention is to simply focus more and more on geopolitics, on security, um, and we see this sort of lessening of economic ties. Um, and so that's, a, I, you know, it'll take time for us to sort of move back so that we into a world um, in which the focus is on trading and cooperation as opposed to conflict and war. Um, so this is, this is not good for the, uh, economically for anyone, and it's certainly not good for the idea of resolving disputes through law. Okay, um, we have here a question um, from Ambassador Del Rosario. Others may be interested to know why the U.S. has totally left the Trans-Pacific Partnership Agreement that aimed to raise standards in trade that it initiated under the Obama administration. So what do you think are the reasons for the U.S. Uh, for doing this? 
Well, that's a great question. Um, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a question, I think it's, it's linked to, well, it's a question of domestic politics. Um, and it's uh, in, in terms of what's happened uh, in the United States. And that is, there's no doubt that the main beneficiaries of uh, trade liberalization in the United States were those with expertise and those who were wealthier. The working classes without an education, um, they simply, their jobs were more at risk uh, of being moved to China. And so the liberalization of international trade in the United States, it empowered the owners of companies and it disempowered workers. Because why? Companies could simply threaten that we will move our factory to China or we'll move our factory to Mexico unless you agree not to uh, raise wages. Um, and workers, they, even if they agreed not to raise wages, it's still, they might lose their jobs. Their jobs became uh, more precarious. When they lost their jobs, the jobs that were available to them didn't pay as much. And so they generally didn't do well. And that meant that, and you all had a process at the same time of less and less, fewer and fewer workers were organized within unions. And so they had those workers who used to vote for the Democratic Party move towards a much more nationalist uh, uh, political party under, as the Republican Party shifted. The Republican Party used to be a pro-trade party and under Trump, it became, President Trump, it became an anti-trade party or at least under his leadership, there are divisions within it still today. Um, but because of that, because of concern about uh, elections, especially in, in, the, in the United States system, certain states are critically important, in particular, Ohio, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and, and Wisconsin. All of those states have, or have manufacturing that has left for, because of uh, China's economic rise. And so Democrats and Republicans are very, want to win those states. And so no one wants to commit to now a, a, a trade agreement where they will, be re, they will be accused of sending jobs abroad. Um, and so until the United States either develops sort of oppor opportunities and retraining, um, for those who, whose jobs are at risk, um, the, the prospect of a new trade agreement, especially in, involving manufactured goods, is very low. Okay, so it's now 11.20 Manila time. I've ex already extended uh, for 20 minutes. Maybe we can entertain two more questions. Last two more questions, anyone? Okay. Uh, a question for both our speakers. Um, where do you think should developing countries like the Philippines start um, when, um, when they plan to develop their legal capacity? Um, so, I mean, what is, you can look to, there's obviously a supply and demand issue, you know, just basic economics, right? So that to the extent that um, the, the economy, businesses, trade um, it increases, there should be more demand, right? Um, both within the public sector and the private sector. Um, and so it's gonna be linked to that, to the extent a country remains sort of a, a, a poor country, which, um, which is more sort of, internally focused, there's probably gonna be much less demand for it. Um, the, uh, in terms of the government, in part, you know, the, the government can create programs. If you looked at China, China created a lot of programs, right? For the private uh, universities and so forth. It created incentives. Um, in fact, most of the research funding in China after it joined the WTO went into international economic law. So there are huge incentives for students um, and for faculty to invest in this expertise. So you see in China, it was really the government took the lead. Um, 
In Brazil, it was more the business associations. Um, you, for example, the big agribusiness in, in Brazil, the big export interests in chicken, and, and um, they created the first big think tank in Brazil it was known as Icone. It was created by an economist named Marcos Yanka. Um, and he basically got funded. He was trained as an economist in the United States. He got funding um, to, uh, from the Chamber of Commerce and others and the, and the agribusiness sectors to put together a team. And they actually came up with negotiating modalities, which were central to create what at the time was called the G20 group with India, China, and 20 other countries in Cancun, Mexico, which is the first time developing countries had put forth negotiating modalities that favored them as a put where to counter the US and China at US and European Union had put together their own modalities. Um, and so there was the private sector, um, which created these sorts of incentives um, for higher and there were students, PhD students and so forth. Um, and so it could come from the public sector, it could come from the private sector, it really depends. In India, the Ministry of Commerce, again, has played a role. They created a center uh, on international trade and investment law. It's actually open for the entire region, so it's also open to students from the Philippines or to, to officials. Um, a friend of mine actually is one of the directors of it. I'm on the board of directors of it as well. Um, and so you see there, they're trying to um, bring in students, PhD students and so forth to gain expertise and then provide ultimate uh, assistance to the government. Professor Ang? Yeah, I, I think I, I, I agree with Professor Schaefer. Uh, basically, you, you have to start like uh, what start from where you already have like you don't start from scratch and and uh, there are already existing uh, um, I mean for institutions for example the business sector here in the Philippines very active the business associations can start that but at the same time I guess uh, there should be some kind of uh, some kind of uh, government interest in, in it as well so it can be like a two-prong approach but uh, you know, depending on the ability of resources, availability of resources, and uh, and the little expertise that you have, um, there should be some kind of a, a fire like what started in in Brazil, some something like a fire starter. Uh, I think at the moment it's like uh, um, it, it's the setup here is basically we do it when there's a demand, when when it lap, and there's a lull, then we stop. So. Mainly from what I know from colleagues who are working on this, uh, they're not really like doing it solely for international trade law. But uh, once there is like, like uh, a request for it, then they will put in uh, a team to do that. So it would be good to come up with some kind of uh, uh, a group or an association uh, that that uh, caters to this kind of uh, of uh, understanding, and and that can start first in the academia and the business sector can like put in some kind of a, a, a matching grant to start the ball rolling. And then the, I think the government can, can come in as well. So it's, it's, it should be a, some kind of a tripartite uh, arrangement where business, government and the academia work together to, to start this uh, in the process in this country. Okay, it seems no more questions um, from the audience or, and so probably we'll just have to end it here. Um, thank you very much again, um, Professor Schaefer for talking about the transnational legal order. And at the same time, I'm surveying um, the developments and, cha and, and challenges of, of maintaining such um, a, a legal order. And also uh, Professor Ang, thank you for for uh, your comments and for all this, for our audience, thank you for joining us today. And I hope um, you would tune in to uh, Miriam College's um, social media networks for announcement of future Diplomatic Hour episodes. Again, thank you very much.
So we will end it here now. Thank you very much, Professor Schaefer and Professor Ang, sir. Thank you so much. Thank you thank very you so much. much. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, okay. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. I hope that was that was great. Uh, Dr. Ang, I'll be at Georgetown in the fall, actually teaching all fall semester, but it sounds like you're there next month. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I'm, I'm 